It's good to be with you all this morning. Is everybody doing all right? How many are a little bit tired like me? Well, guess what? There's plenty of energy with the Lord. Hey, uh, this morning we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 33. So you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles if you've got one. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we would love to put one in your hands because here at New Hope we believe that there is no other piece of literature in the world that brings about more life change and transforming power than the Word of God. And we're passionate about the Word of God. We believe that it's true. We believe that it's without error. And we believe that everything that is in the Bible is true. It never contradicts itself. If you don't believe that, you need to dig into the Word and see for yourself. And so if you don't have one, we'd love to get you one. This morning, I have one challenge. I have one simple thought, and I'm going to give it to you right now. So whether you're ready or not, here it is. Our personal encounters with God will exceed our corporate encounters with God. Your personal encounters with God will exceed your corporate encounters with God. And this morning we're going to be looking at at a man named Moses and how his personal encounters with God impacted his life, impacted his ministry, determined where he went in life, what he did and and how that not just changed his life, but an entire nation's life. And and I believe this wholeheartedly, that that when we have personal encounters with God, that that there are no limits. The limits come off. Anything is is possible. Um, But I I just want to talk about a handful of individuals from the Bible that also had personal encounters with God. And I'm not going to touch on all of them, but we want to see that they had a personal encounter with God, and then there was a result of that. In Genesis chapter 18, a man named Abram had a personal encounter with God where God manifested himself in the form of three men, and now we call Abraham the father of our faith. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah has this personal encounter with God where he throws himself on the ground, declares himself a man of unclean lips, and then he becomes a mouthpiece and a prophet for all of Israel, and he records many prophecies of the coming Messiah. In John chapter 4, Jesus is found with an adulterous woman at the well, and, and, and she's stuck in the sin, and she starts to have this personal encounter with Christ, and she goes back into her town, and in verse 42, it says this, that many Samaritans believed. And they said this, we no longer believe because of what this woman says. We no longer believe because of of her testimony, but now we have seen with our own eyes, we have heard with our own ears, surely this man, Jesus, is the Christ, is the Lord. You see, this woman had a personal encounter with God, and it impacted many Samaritans in her hometown who then had a personal encounter with God, and their lives were forever changed. In Acts chapter 9, a man named Saul who was persecuting the early church and killing Christians and overseeing all sorts of horrible things being done to Christians. He's walking on a road to a town named Damascus and Jesus reveals himself and he has a personal encounter with God. And that man named Saul changes his name to Paul and he begins to... um, build the early church, the same church that he was persecuting, and, 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 and he um, writes over half the New Testament, and he goes around preaching and teaching and, and becomes an incredible pillar of the assemblies, I'm just teasing, of, of God's church, right? We, we see Jesus' 12 disciples, all of them had a personal encounter with God, and all of them went on to do incredible things for the Lord. After the resurrection, not a single one of them had their faith wavered. In fact, 11 of the 12 faced persecution so heavily and so strong that it led to their death. You see, in the Bible, there are are not many stories, if any, that I could find that are worth recording of, of an individual doing something or having something happen that didn't first start with a personal encounter with God. Now, the only instance that I can think that might rival a personal encounter with God would be in Acts chapter 2 when on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out but even with that considered the only real personal story that manifested itself from that particular corporate gathering was when Peter preached and 3,000 were added or saved to that day and I believe that even in that moment even though they were corporate they were they were gathered together there was a large body of believers I believe that they all had individual and personal encounters with God because they all spoke in different languages and in different tongues. See, even though they were gathered together, they were having a personal encounter with God. 
I wholeheartedly believe in the church and gathering together, but this morning God wants to do something personal in your life, and he can. I I don't want anybody to mishear me. I'm a fan of the church. I I believe in the church. Jesus established the church. Jesus loves the church. And Hebrews 10.25 says, let us not forsake gathering together um, as the day draws near, which he's talking about the day of Jesus' return. But he says, instead, let us come together often so that we can encourage each other, so that we can build one another up, so that we can have these personal encounters with God and then come together and minister to one another. Listen, if you buy into the lie that you can do church by yourself with your family at home, and you don't need a body of believers, you've bought into a complete lie and you need to have your eyes open with it. You can be the most spiritual person on earth and you can have encounters with God at home that are so real, but if you're only coming to church two out of four weeks of a month, there's something that's missing and that's you because there's someone here in this congregation that needs you and you need someone else in this congregation. We are a body, we are one and we go as one, but we come back and we gather as one. Your personal encounters with God will exceed our corporate encounters with God. Before we look at our text, I just want to illustrate this um, with you guys. Uh, Elizabeth and and the other three couples that I I talked about uh, to prior uh, to service, uh, I've got, I brought Jordan and Danielle. Uh, They they were using Zach's illustration about three weeks. They've been busy tearing down walls in their relationship. And so we brought them up. They're doing good. And why don't you guys just find a a seat over here? Now, uh, Elizabeth, for those who don't know, this is my wife, Elizabeth. We've been married five and a half years and we still count halves because we're not to 10 years yet. And sort of like when you're a child, you say, how old are you? I'm seven and a half. You know, that half is very important. And um, Elizabeth and I are, are very, very busy um, at times, and, and we try not to let that get in the way of our dates, and, and we do a pretty good job at this, actually. But um, I figured that um, while I was up all last night making just homemade donuts, that I would, I would share with some of these friends, because these are, these are my friends, these are my people, and, and uh, I've been wanting to, to minister, so go ahead and serve yourselves up. We'll pray in just a second, but um, oh, the Lord is good. <laughs> I, I told the early service, there's been three significant days in my life, and the first day was when I asked Jesus into my heart, the second day was when I married Elizabeth, and the third day was when Krispy Kreme came to Des Moines for the first time. I just, <laughs> completely life-changing. I don't know, like, Never mind, I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail. That's, that's my mother restraining rabbit trails where my dad would have just ran down it, so saw the opening and gone. That's my mother restraining, so you can thank her. But uh, I, I figured with, with just being a, a dad of, of, of three kids and working and being a man of many hobbies, I like music, I like hunting, I like fishing. You know, there's always a hunting season. Um, I, I just figured that we could kind of kill two birds with one stone this morning. I want to spend time with my wife and have a date, but I'd also like to minister to my friends and have this time. So let's pray right now, Marin. Okay? Man. No, she didn't take a bite, though. You haven't, right? Yeah, okay, good. So let's, let's just bow our heads. God, donuts are good, but you are better. And I pray this morning that as we break of this bread that you turn all the fat into muscle, God. <laughs> that anybody that is jealous of eating Krispy Kremes right now, that they would be saved. They would rebuke those thoughts in Jesus' name. And bless our time as a couple and, and just uh, together in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, now, you guys go ahead and dig in. This is, this is great. And um, I'm really glad that you guys could come up here. Hey, Jordan, uh, how's, how's the kids doing? Awesome. Yeah, how old are they? Three. I asked the wrong one. Yeah. He's like, uh. <laughs> three and? Three and almost one. And almost one. Man, that's crazy. So is your one-year-old uh, teething pretty hard? All the time. All the time. It's pretty, pretty horrible. Babe, isn't this great? I love you so much. This is so good. I, you know, I'm going to take a little orange juice. Zach, I like your bib. So, so Levi, how are you doing? I'm good, man. Yeah, you are? Yeah, how is the Minnesota sports teams? Probably not, they're not, all bad. they're all bad. All the You're right. Sports. Yep, absolutely. Elizabeth, I love you so much. Marin, is, is your daycare going okay? No, no it's not. <laughs> Hopefully she doesn't watch your kid. <laughs> 
Mm. This is great. This is so good. I'm so glad that you guys do this. Have, have seconds. Keep on eating. It's, it's really good. Now, Elizabeth, would you, you come with me? Just excuse us for a minute. You guys just keep on doing what you're doing. Now, I, uh, I value you, and I love you, and I, I just had a really good time with you. And, um, you know, that was fun. They're great. You know, Zach's a little weird with his bib and everything like that. Um, but I figured that maybe we could have just a little bit more of a private time in an, an intimate setting here and, and just— uh, while I see the value of spending time together, I just, I'm just ready to spend some alone time with you. Could we, could we do something about these lights? <laughs> yeah. And could we uh, maybe put on some music? Is that, is that possible? We got some of that? Oh, yeah. There we go. And, oh, I hope I don't start crying like I did in the early service. You're already crying. <laughs> well, I'll say this again because it's worth saying a million times, but I love you so much. And I'm, I'm, I couldn't even begin to imagine you when I was praying for my future spouse. And my love is so deep and so wide for you, and I'll do anything for you. And I want to lead you. I want to to pour into you, to be the best dad, to be the best husband, to meet every need that you could possibly need. I remember looking for a spouse and thinking, man, I, I want someone who is just going to be an incredible mom. And I remember watching you with the early childhood and watching you, you um, just pour into those little kids. And I remember you taking Joan Hall out for cookies at Arby's and it'd take her a half hour to eat her cookie. And you were just so patient with her. And She's gone on to be with the Lord, and I just, I've seen your heart, and I had no idea what it would be like to actually marry you, and you've surpassed every expectation that I could have ever placed on you, and you've just completely blown me out of the water, and I'm so in love with you, and I, I will always be in love with you, and there might be times where I'm difficult to live with, just blame my dad. but I thank you for everything that you've given me. And I love you with my whole heart. Can we, can we turn the lights down just for a second? <laughs> just teasing. Guys, give it up for our volunteers this morning. <laughs> They're taking the donuts with them. Might as well take the juice, that's fine. You know, while there is value in getting together with your significant other and, and being with, with people and being with friends and, and there's shared laughs and there's memories and, and um, just great things that can happen, it's painfully clear to understand that in a moment of intimacy where it's just you and the individual, there's so much more meaning and, and depth and growth and love that happens in those moments. Now, guys, Valentine's Day is just around the corner. Listen to me very carefully. Do not invite your buddy from work and his, and her, uh, or his spouse to go to dinner with you, okay? Because your wife wants you and all of you, and she's jealous for your time and your attention, and, and you need to give that to her on Valentine's Day. Now, I'm seeing a lot of elbows and a lot of these and like stuff, and some of these guys are I'm, I'm serious, but even more serious, we serve a God who says, I'm a jealous God. I want all of your time. I want your whole attention, not just part attention. I don't want your divided attention. I want everything. I want your time. I, I want you to be so focused on me that there couldn't be anybody else in the room. I want to have a personal encounter with you. So this morning, we're going to be looking at at. Exodus chapter 33, and you can turn there. I've, you've probably been there for a long time. And let me just bring you up to speed because a lot happens in, in the first 32 chapters of Exodus. And we don't have time to read it all, but it's a really exciting book, and I would encourage you to do so. At the beginning of the book, the Israelites were being held captive by the Egyptians and by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was using God's people as slaves, and, and they were heavily oppressed. And in, 
Exodus chapter 3, Moses has this incredible personal experience and encounter with God where God manifests himself in the form of a burning bush. And, and, and God calls um, Moses, and he says, I want you to set my people free. You need to go back into Egypt, and you need to talk to Pharaoh, and, and you need to set my people free. And Moses is like, I stutter. I'm, 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 not, I'm not well adverse. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the man for the job. I, I, can't, I can't hardly speak. And God's like, go. And so he has this encounter with God, and Moses obeys. He goes to Israel. He says, let God's people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. And the Lord sends 10 plagues to Egypt. And finally, Pharaoh had had enough, and, and he lets the Israelites go. And so Moses leads the entire nation across the Red Sea by parting the Red Sea and the waters um, spreading. And in the, in the wilderness, God continued to provide for all of Israel and provide food and manna from heaven and provided water from a rock. And in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, God makes this covenant. He makes this promise. He, he, he says these words. He says, The Lord said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God— and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I, the Lord, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Four chapters later, Exodus chapter 19, Moses is um, at the, the foot of, of Mount Sinai, and he goes up to Mount Sinai, and he does something that has never been done in the history of mankind. He, he goes up and he downloads a message from a cloud and he puts it on a tablet. And if you didn't get that joke, you don't know what you're missing out because my jokes are fire, okay? <laughs> he receives the Ten Commandments and he puts them on two stone tablets. He receives a lot of other laws and instructions that God commands. And then in Exodus chapter 2, he comes down the mountain. And what is Israel? What is God's people doing in that moment? Doing the exact opposite of what, what God has instructed him and said, man, if you follow me, I'll provide. If you follow me, I'll, I'll lead you. And, and he comes down and they've taken all their gold and all their jewelry and made this golden calf and all of Israel's marching around it singing praises to this idol. And Moses is furious and he takes the two stone tablets that God himself with his finger wrote in and inscribed in it and he smashes them down on the ground and he rebukes the people and he says, you wicked people, how could you? And he goes before the Lord and he says, God, please hold your, your wrath among these people. Remember your promise. Be gracious and be kind. And he pleads for these people. And, and, and then uh, Moses, again, he goes and rebukes. And there's this whole um, violent scene. And, and you can read about it. Um, and, and eventually, after a, a, a while, all of Israel understands at this point that both Moses and God are very serious in this thing. I don't think that there is any question like, okay, there's not going to be a golden calf anymore. And so Moses is about ready to go back up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments for a second time. And that's where uh, we are going to be reading from today. Chapter 33, starting in verse 18. Follow along with me, if you will. Then Moses said... And he's meeting with the Lord in this moment. Then, then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will pro proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Chapter 34, the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even flocks and herds may graze in the front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out the two stone tablets like the first ones and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down and a cloud stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins sin of their father to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed down 
He bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. O Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, Moses said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders like never done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you to do. For today, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars and smash their sacred stones and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. And then he continues to speak different words and and instructions. We're going to jump down to verse 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant of the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai and with the two tablets and the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant, or some versions say that his face shone, shined, shone. Because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, but they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and spoke to them. Afterward, excuse me, Krispy Kreme. (laughs) Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and gave them all of the commands of the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what had been commanded. They saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. God, I pray that this morning that your word would speak to our hearts, that you would open up ears. God, for those that really struggle with hearing your voice, God, I pray that this morning that there would be clarity, that all other things would just be parted like the Red Sea, that they would have tunnel vision, that they would have tunnel ears, and that you would grow our our God sensors, our antennas that register your voice, Jesus. I pray that you would speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. amen. The first thing that I want to point out this morning is that when you have a personal encounter with God, people will notice. In verse 29, it says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai and with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, they were afraid of him. See, Moses encountered God in such a tangible way that his very presence changed. How many have ever been around an individual where you could just feel God, like you could just see God's love and experience his love and the joy? And and man, I'll tell you, when I was at Passion Conference with the college students a few weeks ago, there was a a worship uh, leader, uh, um, I'm trying to think of his name, Torin Wells, I think. Uh, And he just had this smile that was so contagious. And I I was like, I've never seen a smile like that on anybody in the face of the earth. The joy of the Lord was upon him. You could see and sense that there was a presence about him. When you spend time with having personal encounters and, and being in the presence of God, people can sense that because God's character is infused in you and put into your DNA. And then it just begins to ooze out of you, out of your words, out of your actions, where you go the things that you do. One of my favorite smells in the entire world is bonfire. Anybody else like the smell of bonfire? Oh my goodness. They need to make like a scentsy pot like that and just get me a vat of it and I'm just going to put it on my stove and just cook the bonfire. I love the smell of bonfire and whenever I'm at a bonfire, I stand as close to the fire as I possibly can. And sometimes when the wind is blowing and the smoke is blowing, I'll intentionally stand in the path of the smoke so that I just reek of the smoke. My, my clothes, my hair, my skin, everything about it. And then I go home and I'll take my hoodie that I'm wearing and I'll go to bed and I'll pull my hoodie up close to my face so that I can just smell the bonfire in that moment. I also love the smell of coffee. I hate the taste. I don't drink it. I don't need to drink it. 
because I've got an addictive personality and it's just one more thing I can throw five bucks out the window at, right? I, I, I can't stand the, the taste of coffee, but I love the smell of it. And I find myself at Friedrich studying or meeting with individuals. And when I come home from a coffee appointment, Elizabeth says, I can tell that you were at a, a coffee um, today. You went to Friedrich's or you went to Starbucks. Listen, when we spend time in God's presence, when we spend time in the presence of God, we begin to smell like God. We begin to taste like God. We begin to see the things that God sees. And and our very presence and, and, and being begins to change. I want that in my life. I want that when I walk that people can feel. I want when, when someone comes into my home that they can feel a lightness, that they can feel life around me, that they don't feel drained about, about me. They can feel God who's the source of life flowing out of me into my friendships, into my relationships. I long to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit when I lead worship, when I preach, when, when I coach t-ball, when I draft my fantasy football team. I'm sick of losing. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In every encounter that I have, I want people to say, wow, I I noticed something about you. You've been in the presence of God. I want to be like Peter where when I walk, my shadow casts on someone and and the presence of God is so strong that it brings about healing. Some of you say, well, that's just myth. No, it's not. I believe wholeheartedly in the supernatural. I've seen supernatural in so many different things. I've seen people healed of cancer. I've seen, I've seen incredible stories. And if you open up your eyes and you look around, you'll begin to hear and see incredible stories. We had the entire series, Stories of Hope. There's people in some pretty dark situations where only Jesus could pull them out of it. I had a conversation a couple weeks ago, and they're here today, and, and I asked him what changed uh, in, in his addiction to alcohol, and he said it was in a second step in Alcohol Anonymous where it says, I need to surrender, and they use, I think, an all, a higher power. And there was something that changed in that moment when he really surrendered to God. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yeah. This is not just make-believe stuff. This is real. This is real. And the word of God, as I said earlier, if you think it contradicts itself or, or you're just not believing in it, dig into it because it, it, it will do 10 times more than a preacher could ever preach at you. I want to have my demeanor, my, my presence change. And can I just say this too? In the same way that people can tell when you've been in the presence of God, if there's a sin that you're struggling with in private, people can sense that. They might not be able to put, pinpoint it and say, huh, I'm not sure what that is, something's off, but you'll begin to stink like your sin. It's time that we purify ourselves in the blood of Jesus and ask him to just completely envelop who we are that we would reek of his presence. The second thing that might happen when you spend time having personal encounters with God is that people might be uncomfortable around you. Verse 30 says that when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, they were afraid to come near me. Now some of you are thinking, I don't want people to be afraid of me. I want people to like me. And, and to a certain extent, like I share that sentiment. I want you to like me, but I also know that where there's light, darkness cannot exist. Darkness cannot overcome light, but darkness is just simply the absence of light. People might be uncomfortable in your presence because of what you stand for. People might be uncomfortable that you refuse to drink at your, uh, your, your work parties. People might be uncomfortable when you stand up for pure conversations and you won't submit to guy talk at the office. People might be uncomfortable when you opt out of going to a movie with your girlfriends after dinner, say, you know what? I'm not sure that that content, I, I, I want to expose myself to that. People might be uncomfortable with that. And you know what? Sometimes Christians are the worst. 
Because it's like you get this band of Christians. Trust me, I, I went to a Christian university, and a lot of things like slid under the radar because, oh, I'm with a whole bunch of Christians, and so we all know we're teasing. We all know we're joking. We all know this is wrong, and this is fine. And sometimes when you stand up in the midst of your Christian friends and you say, you know what, no, this is not okay, and no, I'm not going to talk this way, and no, I'm not going to do that, sometimes the Christians are the the most religious Pharisee-type people that there are, and they're uncomfortable. How many have ever been awakened by a light where you're just asleep in a complete dark room and someone comes in and just flips on the light? right? The first reaction is to shoot the guy. No, I'm just teasing. The first reaction is, is just to like close your eyes, pull the covers back over your head. You wince at it, right? And, and then slowly but surely, you just let a little bit of light under your covers, just, oh, just a little bit. You rub the eye boogers out, get the crusties out. And, and slowly but surely, you begin to adjust to the light, and your pupils begin to dilate or whatever the term is and and just get in the correct form and then you awaken right i'm not an optologist i'm not an eye doctor (laughs) can't even say the word pastor is pretty easy if you're from the south you're a pastor you know man people are asleep in darkness and when you enter into the room and you have a different just attitude and, 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 and just presence about you, they're going to wince. They're going to pull back. They're going to be uncomfortable. But being comfortable never brings about change. Some of the greatest growth and, and development that an individual can have comes in persecution. It comes in trials. It comes in the form of a death of a loved one. Man, we, we, have, we have got to, to let our light shine bright. If, if you're not having people be a little bit uncomfortable around you, then maybe your little light of mine is not as bright as you might think it is. Now, I'm not saying that we go around and just whack people over the head with the Bible and just smack them. You heathens, stop living together. Stop this. Stop that. Stop this. I'm not saying that we do that. That's mean. That's religion but your very presence is like light coming into the room and they wince and they hide from it, but then eventually they're drawn to it and they begin to awaken spiritually and awaken as an individual. We need to be the light of the world. Maybe you're just terribly like afraid of having a personal encounter with God. To that, I say, go for it. Embrace it. Dig deep. How long are you willing to wait for it? Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights. People will notice. They might be uncomfortable, but eventually people will listen. Your light spirit, your holy presence, your consistent demeanor, it will begin to open up windows, if not doors of opportunity, where you begin to speak into an individual's life. I'll tell you, Jared Atchison, uh, he's, he's my best friend, and um, at work they call him preacher. Now they know that he's going to school to uh, get, get his license to preach and different things, but you know, I'm, I'm sure the first year or so that he was there, they were kind of doing that to poke him and see like, if I poke you, really, is Jesus going to come out of you, or are you just kind of talking the talk? And and and. They kind of prod him, and it's all in fun love, but over the course of several years, they know where Jared stands, and now he's got men in his department at at Clive uh, Works um, that come to him and ask him for prayer. Hey, my marriage is really struggling. Would Would you pray for me? Do you have any insight? This is what's going on. I'm telling you, when, when, when people notice you, when maybe they're uncomfortable, they'll eventually be drawn back and it will present a platform for you to share Christ in their life. Do you think that Louis Giglio or John Piper or Billy Graham or Francis Chan or Stephen Furtick or Beth Moore or Priscilla Schreiner or any of of these big name speakers, whoever it might be, do you think that God just elevated them immediately to that form of platform where they can speak and just do wonderful things? No. It was in the personal encounters. It was in moments where it said, you know what, Louie, I want you to do this. 
You know what, Beth, I want you to do this. And they just take a baby step. And when in that obedience, they see God's faithfulness and then God stretches them a little bit more. I want you to do this. That's a little weird, but I feel it. Let's, let's go for it and takes it. And then you see God's faithfulness in it. And then eventually you get to the point where God calls you to build an ark and it hasn't even rained. You say, okay, God, I'm in. Some of you guys feel frustrated and you're like, I just feel like I have so much knowledge and so much goodness and I want the platform to be able to share that. Can I just tell you it starts with your connection with God? It starts with personal encounters with God. In preparing for this sermon, I had this simple thought. If God is wanting all people to encounter him, if it's God's heart that all know him, And if it's true that people can experience God through you and through me, then the equation of influence would be something like this. The deeper your connection with God is, the greater your influence will be because God's heart is that all people encounter him and come to know him. I'll read that again. Think about that. The deeper your connection with God is, the greater your influence will be because God's heart is that all people will encounter him and come to know him. In other words, if you smell like God, God is going to lure people into your realm of influence so that he can, they can encounter God through you. I believe it. I want that. I want that for you, and you guys can have that. But it starts with personal revival. Listen, we had some wonderful services with Micah McDonald on, on the 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, whenever that was at the beginning of, of January. That's not what brings revival. We didn't do that thinking, well, that's just going to set our, our hearts on fire, and that's just going to light this place. You know, this is just going to be great in that moment. That's not why we did that. What we did that is to kind of give you a kickstart kind of a kick in the pants and say, like, let's spend time in God's presence more than just on Wednesdays and Sundays. Let's let's get so hungry for God. And, And trust me, you cannot be hungry for God unless God places that hunger in you. Some of you are like, man, I just can't even pray for five minutes. Ask God to give you the hunger to do that. Ask God to help you to do that. We can't even breathe without him. So what what makes us think that we can even desire him without him? The Father draws us in. We need God's strength in everything that we do, in our worship, in our work, in our marriages, in our relationships. We need God's strength. And it starts with a personal ascending up to Mount Sinai, being in the presence of God, going into the tent of meetings, being in the presence of God, and then being sent back down and so that our relationships and our marriages can look godly. Help us, Jesus. When you have a personal encounter with God, people will notice they might be uncomfortable, but that eventually they'll listen. Could it be that Israel experienced God in a corporate way? Could it be that all of Israel, when, when God was sending these ten plagues to, to Egypt and they saw all these different things, and, and then they walked across the, the Red Sea as the, the waters were, were spread and, and, and as food fell from heaven and water came out of a rock, could it be that in those moments all of Israel was encountering God in a corporate way instead of in an individual personal encounter with God? And what happens? They turn to their idols I'll tell you this, I believe this 10 out of 10 times that the most faithful, the most steadfast, the most giving, the most forgiving, the most joy-filled, the, the most gracious, the most merciful, the, the cream of the crop of Christians, if you will, are those that are having personal encounters with God on a daily basis. They aren't dependent upon who's leading worship. You know what I love about this church is we've got a whole bunch of different pastors that can present the word of God. And it may come out differently, but the word of God will always be preached in here. And you know what I love about this church is that there's a whole bunch of different personalities that get to lead worship. Because we all have different personalities. But guess what? I'm mature because I don't need Pastor Brett up here, or I don't need Marin up here, or I don't need Pastor Weaver up here to worship. Because I'm worshiping God. I have direct access to him. I don't have to flow through an individual. I don't have to throw through piano. I don't have to flow through drums and bass and electric guitar. I flow to the God who has created everything because I want a personal connection with him. And the extremities, the extras don't matter. I'm here for God. (laughs) 
This morning we're not closing with a corporate song, but in a, a time of prayer. Ron, you can start that in music. For some of you, it's been a long time since you've ever heard the voice of God, or maybe you've never heard the voice of God, and you're sitting here like, how do I know if God's speaking to me? Right? Well, first, if he asks you to do something, or you feel like you have a thought come to your mind, ask yourself, does this line up with the word of God? And if you don't know, then search. Or if you don't know, ask someone who does know, and and figure out in the Bible, is what you're telling me, God, is this from God? Because God's not going to tell you to bomb an abortion center. God's not going to tell you to punch your neighbor. God's not going to tell you to to be mean and malicious. God is going to bring love and mercy and forgiveness and a restorative heart. And we need to, every time we think we hear of God, is this to bring people into the presence of God or is this not aligning with God's word? See, sometimes we allow veils to get in the way of God encounters. And what do I mean by a veil? A veil is a piece of cloth that protects or conceals a woman's faith before seeing her groom. To veil something is to conceal it. It prevents something from fully being seen. And I I see two potential veils in this room and, and in our lives that's so prevalent. And the first one is a phone. Man, that can prevent you from having a personal encounter with God. Now, imagine with me that we're back at the beginning of service, and I'm sitting here with Elizabeth, and, and I'm, I'm pouring out my heart, and I'm having this intimate moment with her, and I lean in for a kiss, and my phone goes off. Talk about a buzz kill. Right? But how many times, and how many times in the future are we going to allow that to happen? You know why I like a paper Bible? Because my paper Bible doesn't ding. (laughs) There's nothing more spiritual about it. I use my phone Bible plenty. But are we going to allow the veil of a phone get in the way? Ding! Oh, God must be sending me a message on Snapchat. Better check this out, you know. Oh, man, uh, my phone is in the room. It's over here. It's playing music, whatever it is. Uh, I I forgot that at work. I really need to to send that message. I need to do that. I need to take care of that before I forget about it. I need to do this. And we allow this veil to prevent us from having a face-to-face personal encounter with God. The second veil that that we see, and, and it's so prevalent, is music. Particularly music with words. Some of you guys can't even pray without music. You realize that you're talking to God through a veil in that moment? Man, God has written a song on someone's heart, and he wants to do the same thing for you. But you're never going to hear it if you've got Carrie Job or Cody Carnes or Christian Stanfield or Chris Tomlin or Fannie Mae or whoever. Is Fannie Mae the, the old hymn one? Fanny Crosby. Fanny Mae's the country singer that was... What is it? I don't know what it is. But the point is this. The point is this. God wants to write something on your heart. And we allow music to just get in the way. I love this music right here. This is William Augusto, A-U-G-U-S-T-O. It's three hours of this. I find myself just sitting in my car. A lot of people think I'm an extrovert. A lot of people think, man, you just love to be around people. Actually, people drain me. I'm an introvert in nature. I love people. I can be around them. I can talk like this. But I'll tell you what, after this, I'm so tired, my legs hurt. I just want to just go out in the woods and curl up in a ball and be away from people for a while and recharge. Because people for me sometimes can be a veil. And in a minute, we're going to take away the veils of this room. For you, that might be meaning I need to come forward, take a step forward because... Right now, I'm smelling the person next to me. Or right now, I'm, I, you know, I just, I just need that space. Like when I'm praying and stuff like that, or I'm just in my moment, if someone comes up and prays for me, and, and, and you know, like that, that really distracts me. 
Now, I'm not saying that if you feel led to pray for someone that you can't go up and pray for them. I, I'm not speaking against spirit-led prayer, okay? I'm not, but like, that is a veil for me is just being around people. So I have to find ways that I can encounter God face to face. What is the veil that God is revealing to you? And Elijah, he'd remove the veil, go into the tent of meetings, encounter God, and come out and people would notice. Can we go to the worship setting on the lights? This morning, we're going to spend five minutes allowing God to speak to us. And as I said, there might be different veils right now. And I just want to release anybody in this moment if you feel like you need to stand, if you feel like you need to come forward to the altar, if you feel like you need to turn around and kneel in your your seat, if you feel like you need to go to the back, wherever you need to go in order to have a personal encounter, removing those veils, removing those distractions, I just want to give you the freedom. But let's just take a moment to posture ourselves and silence our hearts so that we might hear what God is doing and step into the way that he's moving this morning. So God, in this moment, right now, we ask that you'd forgive us of our sins because we know that sin creates a barrier between us and you, God. And so we proclaim the blood of Jesus to cleanse all unrighteousness, make us pure before our eyes so that we can step into your holiness. Make us pure, God. Prepare our hearts for what you have to speak to us, God. I pray that you'd give dreams, visions, clear words, instructions, God. Pray that the peace and joy of the Lord would flow like never before. I pray that the confused mind would have a moment of peace and that they would be able to take the reins of their mind in this moment and sort truth and reality from the lies and the chaos. God, we quiet our hearts. We open our ears, our eyes, our minds to you. I believe that God is going to speak maybe to someone this morning a word. I'll give opportunity after we spend time, but in this moment, speak to us, God, and reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name.